if a small town kingpin threatened to wipe out your entire family, unless you return the small fortune your idiot brother stole from him, what would you do? Folks around these parts don't take too kindly to law and order, but there's one rule out here that everybody abides. Don't screw around with Mr. Cross's money. Too bad no one told Uncle Reggie about that. Now we're being hunted by hardened criminals that know exactly who we are. They're not gonna stop until they get what's theirs. That is, unless the locals get to us first. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made what you should do and how to beat the crime lord in end of the road. Harvey Ruck is ready to retire. He's had his fill of playing bagman for chump change while the boss is sitting at home stacking cash. And it seems today's the day he's finally going to do something about it. Following a grossly unnecessary helicopter drop that would almost certainly attract the attention of everyone around for miles, Harvey subtly attempts to bring his partner in on the steal. But it seems Ocho is more than happy with the current situation. Like the arrangement? Talk to Mr. Cross. Otherwise, shut the f up, bro. Well, so much for collective bargaining. Guess it's time for the strike. Poor guy never even saw it coming. You see, this is why you don't work for cartels. If movies and TV have taught me anything, it's that you'll probably wind up getting double-crossed by your own greedy and or paranoid business partners. Beard bro made a huge mistake by not taking Harvey's boss makes a dollar I make a dime spiel seriously. After all, if he's willing to screw over the most powerful and dangerous man in the area, what do you think he's willing to do to some disposable flunky. Were I in Ocho's shoes, I would have played along until I could get the drop on him. Not only would our life clearly depend on it, but we could very well land ourselves his share and even a bonus for taking out the traitor before he could pull a fast one. Of course, for that very reason, Harvey should have kept his treacherous ideations to himself and just blown the dude's brains out as soon as they were alone. Fact is, there was no way of knowing whether Ocho was planning a double cross of his own, so better to just plant one in his skull and live on wondering rather than risk finding out the hard way. Besides, twice the takers means half the take. And if this Mr. Cross is as bad as he's made out to be, we'll want every dollar we can get our hands on to get as far away from him as possible. Sometime later, Brenda Freeman and family are a few hours into the first leg of their 1,500 plus mile road trip from Los Angeles, California to Houston, Texas. And so far, things are going pretty well. That is, until an unforeseen stretch of road work forces them to take a detour through bump nowhere Arizona. After filling up at some podunk gas station, Brenda's daughter Kelly unwittingly provokes the local wildlife. And it turns out they aren't the kind to save it for leg day. Not long after leaving the station, the married travelers are set upon by an old beater pickup driven by a pissed off pair of good old boys from earlier. Hmm, why does this sound familiar? Kids look a deer! Oh, that's right. And if memory serves, the Griswolds made it out just fine. You know, for the most part. However, this time around, there's a lot more to worry about than Sparky's criminally negligent driving. Just then, the pursuers start pulling some joyride shit and nearly run the family off the road before racing off ahead and blocking both lanes of travel. You have a pants problem. You look like a teenage boy who got called on in class at the worst moment. Cure the bulge in your pants with this video's sponsor, The Ridge Wallets. Fat wads of cash in a fist-sized wallet was cool 20 years ago. Now it's all about cosplaying as a high-speed low-drag operator with a slim stainless steel and RFID blocking to prevent remote hacking of up to 12 cards you can hold inside it. It does fit modest wads of cash as well. Complete your Call of Duty LARP by matching your Ridge wallet color to your Meta Ultra Low Recoil Stockless AR with Black Damascus, Denali, Mount Rainier, or North Shore. I think the Ridge needs to make an obsidian wallet. God, it just looks so good. These wallets are so durable that they can stop a bullet. No, literally. The Titanium One could stop a 9mm at close range. Don't try it at home, though. Comes with a lifetime guarantee, 45-day test drive, or your money back. And of course, no bulge is fully cured without the key case. All the good good from the wallet, but for your jingle jangle. Your, your keys. The tension panel locks in and organizes your keys. The Ridge knows that wrapping your key ring around your finger to Wolverine and attack her with your mailbox keys is liable to get you killed. That's why they also sell the Summit Knife. Open your mail or let someone f***ing around on level 10 find out. Plus, it looks dope. Get the best deal by going to ridge.com slash nerdexplains and right now you can save up to 40% through December 22nd. Well, this is just great. Whatever that pile has under the hood appears to be more than a match for our suburban so turning around would probably result in the same exact predicament, just in the other direction. And since I highly doubt anyone here brought any kind of firepower, forcing some kind of 
confrontation with these lowlifes could leave us at a huge disadvantage if they're willing to put this mess on active self-protection. It's far from the most Frank Castle strat I've come up with so far, but I think the best option here is to just sit tight with the engine running and our foot on the brake while keeping an eye on the potential threats. From here, we'd be in the best position to react to whatever they do next, including running their asses over if they get out brandishing any weapons. Ideally, they'll quickly wind up getting bored and leave us alone. However, given there's a detour on a major route forcing people to come through this way, it's pretty likely some other drivers will show up sometime soon, thereby forcing them to clear the road. In the meantime, we should call 911 as young Cam suggests, and make it obvious at that. A sparsely populated area like this means these two scumbags are almost certainly known quantities to the local police. After all, you don't just pick today to start brutally assaulting your fellow motorists, even if someone did shoot you the bird. Nah, you're right. That's some milk toast garbage if I've ever heard it. Instead, we'll just send Queen Latifah out to deal with these punks single-handedly. Can't see this going sideways. Jesus Christ, at least have Ludacris jump behind the wheel in case you need to make a quick getaway. Fortunately for everybody involved, they're only after an apology. You know, sorry you almost killed us and all that. Only there's a catch. Can't just say it. You gotta mean it. Unless you want us to make your whole family apologize. It's about time the couple pieces of trailer trash tacitly threatened to wipe out your entire family with granddad's old deer rifle that you realize you should have just sat in the car for a little bit. For real, you're planning to spread this trip out over the course of three days. It's not like you're in a hurry. Thankfully, Brenda has the emotional fitness to put pride aside and reluctantly offers up the desired apology, which turns out to be really all it takes to send these cow pies speeding off to the nearest pro wrestling event, and not a moment too soon. Reggie was about three seconds away from drastically escalating the situation. Don't worry though, he'll f*** things up soon enough. With the crisis averted, the family pulls into the nearest roadside dump to post up for the night. Ah, yes, the Sunset Motel. Nothing like the constant glow of bright red neon lights in your face to keep you well rested on your cross-country adventure. Yet another reason to knock road trips out as quickly as possible. The fewer places you have to stop, the more you can shell out for accommodations. Seriously, that altercation with the Duke boys cost you, what, three minutes? Just trade off with Uncle Tej until you reach the approximate halfway mark and find somewhere to stay that doesn't look like the set of a horror movie. Despite the eyesore and Reggie's incessant snoring, everyone finally manages to get some sleep, only to be rudely awakened in the middle of the night by their next door neighbor's midnight quarrel. And it doesn't sound like they're slinging pillows in there. Oh, but don't let that stop Brenda from needlessly leaving her family behind to waltz right into the danger zone yet again. I'm an ER nurse. For all we know, some woman might be getting beat by a man. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were saying? Ignoring the obvious gunshot for a second, you'd have to be absolutely insane to go out there under the assumption you might be breaking up spousal abuse. You have all of zero evidence to support that conjecture. And even if you're right, domestic calls are widely regarded to be among the most dangerous situations you could possibly insert yourself into. And that's by the police, no less. You know, the people with guns and body armor and training. You've got none of that. And you're willing to risk your life and possibly even your family's lives by walking blindly into a snafu of indeterminate magnitude. Awesome. Of course, once things start popping off, Brenda's finally confronted with the realization she might be in over her head. Especially since now there's someone outside their room frantically trying to open their door. But this moment of clarity doesn't last long, as the second they hear the sound of someone driving off, Brenda goes barreling out the front door straight towards the source of the shot, with her brother and daughter right on her heels. Jesus Christ, lady, there's like a million possible scenarios that could be playing out right now. Half of which end with you being shot dead this second you go through that door. I mean, for all you know, the recipient was the one that just took off while the shooter's hanging around to loot the place. Never mind the fact that you had no idea whether the person that was trying to get into your room even left at all. There's legitimately one and only one rational response to this situation, and it's basically the same one as earlier. Get on the floor, call the police, and don't move until you either know for sure the coast is clear or the immediate circumstances force you to act in self-defense. <sighs> what am I saying? Clearly, sound decision-making is well beyond the grasp of anyone that would hold up in a place like this for the evening. Take our Vic, for instance. What's the matter, Harvey? Not feeling good? Better stick a thumb in it, bro. Something tells me the nearest hospital is a bit out of your range. Should have kept the 870 on the door at all times. The hell are you even doing here in the first place? You just ripped off some regional Walter White wannabe for a gym bag full of Benjamins, and you're really gonna spend the night in the same general area. <laughs> Screw bed rest. Now 
is when you see if some of those gas station trucker tabs are worth all the hype. Shouldn't have stopped driving until you started seeing igloos. And speaking of the former errand boy's ill-gotten gains, look what Reggie finds under the sink while searching for extra towels. Sadly, despite Nurse Brenda's best efforts, old Harvey ends up taking the shitty motel temperature challenge. After relating their story to the police, the Freemans set out to put this whole episode in the rear view. But Captain Hammers of the Arizona State Police has other ideas. The way he sees it, they may very well be in danger should the killer seek to snuff out any potential witnesses witnesses, prompting him to call Brenda up and, I kid you not, ask her to turn around and come back to the scene of a brutal homicide. Yeah, thanks, but no thanks, Super Trooper. What exactly does he expect us to do? Live in his basement, banking on the 50-50 shot this case even gets cleared? Besides, ever hear that old line about the killer always returning to the scene of the crime? The last thing we need is for him to ID us because we swung back around to play witless protection. Unfortunately, it won't make a difference either way, as no sooner than Brenda hangs up on the captain, she receives a call from an unknown number with troubling news. And it has nothing to do with our vehicle's extended warranty. Boss man wants his money. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't call me back. Wow, you really told them. So let me get this straight. A few hours ago, you were knuckle deep in some dude's neck after an unknown assailant broke into his room, beat his ass, and shot him. Then, a state police captain says you might be in danger. And now you've just received a threatening phone call from someone using a voice changer who addressed you by name. How on earth are you not immediately drawing a connection between these events? Clearly, whatever went down back at the motel was related to all the money they mentioned. And regardless of whether you really took something from them, the fact that they think you did will be every bit as bad for your health if they catch up to you. Worse, actually. Because even if you wanted to give it back to them, you won't be able to. Which I promise you, they're not going to believe. Meaning you and your family are going to get the jumper cables until you either burst into flames or develop superpowers, and I doubt it's the latter. The good news is that they probably wouldn't resort to scare tactics unless they legitimately had no idea where we are, and even where we're headed. Otherwise, they'd just dispatch Anton Chigurh to punch our cards with the cattle stunner without saying a word. After all, letting us know they're onto us would only make us warier and even force us into hiding, which would likely involve spending a lot of the money they think we have. In any case, our best option right now is to keep moving until we reach our destination, and then never tell another living soul what happened along the way. Following yesterday's run-in with the pickup hicks, Kelly mentioned we were a couple hours outside of Tucson, meaning at most we're only about 17 hours away from Houston. Sure, that might sound like a lot, but split between the two drivers it shouldn't be an issue, especially knowing what we're leaving behind. You know what's not gonna help the situation? Stopping every 30 minutes to feed chickens. But hey, at least it gives Uncle Reggie an opportunity to reveal what a complete and utter moron he is without the rest of the family finding out. People sit inside. It's gotta be drug money, right? Who f***ing cares what kind of money it is? You found it stashed 10 feet away from a dead man. Sure, it'd be one thing if you weren't the ones to call it in. But now there's an official public record tying your family to the incident. Of course they're going to suspect you were the ones who took it. Especially if they bought someone inside the force. Which is pretty likely given the amount of money we're moving through the area. Are you so incapable of thinking more than 30 seconds ahead that you would not only steal money from known murderers, but also allow your family to hang around? right down the road from the scene of the crime. Seriously, the least you could have done is demand that we keep moving to make it harder for them to track us down. At this rate, we run the risk of randomly bumping into them a la Marcellus Wallace. All right, there's no need to panic just yet. At this point, we can do one of three things, two of which aren't all that cash money, but they'll most likely keep us alive. The first option would be to stash the bag out in the desert somewhere and send the killers the GPS coordinates as soon as we're clear. Unless they're purely driven driven by spite, they'll probably consider us more trouble than we're worth once we get their dough back. After all, we've already told the cops everything we know, and none of it's sufficient to land any one person behind bars. Option two would be to discreetly leave the bag somewhere the contents would be made public, like a police station or a local news agency. Once word gets out the money is in custody, and thus no longer in our possession, they may well cut their losses for the same reasons mentioned previously. Besides, their last hit job was sloppy as hell. And adding another 
other four bodies on top of that would just draw more attention they can't afford. Fans of the channel already know what I'm going to say for door number three, and naturally, it revolves around using the money to arm ourselves to the teeth before falling off the face of the planet. Problem is, a loosely packed gym bag full of cash probably won't amount to more than a few hundred thousand dollars, which isn't nothing, but it's definitely not going to last forever. That said, it should be enough for us to start our lives over somewhere very far away, preferably with a moat. Ultimately, Brenda's unwilling to sully her hands with dirty money, and in fear that turning it into the police would only implicate her family in the slang, she goes for a dumbed-down version of option number one, instead stashing the bag in another motel room and leaving a key under the doormat so the killers can let themselves in. I'll get into why this is such a terrible idea here in a minute, but for now, let's focus on the absolute insanity that is her next move. Tell me, what do you think Brenda decides to do after dead dropping a pile of blood money to the local crime syndicate? Did you guess? Immediately forget about the entire situation and drag her family to the nearby tombstone knockoff? If so, you've definitely seen this one before because there is absolutely no reason a rational human being would ever think of something like that. Now, it's widely believed that there's an infinite number of universes out there, and if that's the case, I can confidently say there is not a single goddamn one wherein this unprecedented act of profound stupidity doesn't result in them being tracked down by the cartels. And now this is happening. You have something of his, Brenda. And now Mr. Claus has something of yours. Oh man, who could have seen that coming? For the love of God, given everything you've been through up to this point, why would you let anyone in the group out of your sight for even a single second? And guess what? She's gonna do it again. That's right. The second Reggie comes back with Cam's phone, Brenda immediately leaves him and Kelly high and dry in the middle of nowhere to go make the exchange by herself. As if they'll be any safer stranded out at this roadside sh show than they would be coming along for the ride. I mean, the simple fact that your son was just kidnapped here means this place is not safe at all. You're just creating yet another opportunity for people you care about to get killed by charging headfirst without thinking. Oh, and speaking of not thinking, let's revisit that whole motel stash point she set up, shall we? You know, those little do not disturb signs they give you to hang on to your doorknob when you don't want the staff coming into your room? It turns out those only determine whether they tidy up the place or just go rifling through all your sh** while you're not around. Pretty much makes any kind of rented accommodations only marginally more secure than a stall in a public bathroom. Luckily, Brenda makes it back just in time to catch the maid sneaking back to her wage cage with the goods. And you know what that means. Time for a ridiculous car chase through the sagebrush, almost half of which is just them spinning brodies in the gravel instead of taking any meaningful action towards achieving their ultimate goals. Eventually, Brenda lands a successful pit maneuver on the thief, bringing the pursuit to a close in a dramatic rollover just outside the mayor's mansion. Well, this looks like a lovely part of town. Better keep the Chevy running in case all the commotion draws a crowd. And sure enough, the welcome wagon rolls out at just the perfect time to tragically misread the situation. Although, judging by that tattoo on the ringleader's forehead, it's safe to say Brenda wasn't going to be popular here no matter what. Too bad that bat is a bat and not something belt-fed, because there is no way we're walking out of this mess without seriously thinning them out. I'm leaving. <laughs> That is, if she walks out at all. Meanwhile, back in Civilization, Uncle Reggie's finally broken the news to Kelly about what's really going on. And as you could probably imagine, she's not super stoked about it. And the fact that her mom won't pick up the phone isn't helping one bit. Just then, in walks Captain Hammers, who immediately makes a beeline for their table. Evidently, he just finished searching the Wild West town and figured this is the only other place they could be. Although, it kind of makes you wonder why he would ever have thought to look Look there in the first place. Hmm. Whatever the case, Hammers waste no time launching into just how foobar their situation really is, mentioning the missing payout from the Sinaloa cartel and the world of hurt Brenda and Cam will be in, lest they tell him where they went. Only problem is, they have absolutely no idea where to even begin. All they know is that Cam was kidnapped and his mom went somewhere to try and get him back. Still, without any means of transportation and barely more than the clothes on their backs, what all can they really do other 
otherwise. Despite her uncle's silent protests, Kelly eventually cracks and spills the beans, landing them both a ride back to the captain's house in his 69 Continental. Bit odd for a police cruiser, don't you think? I mean, it's literally a notorious gangster car driven by Sicilian mafiosos as a status symbol. Sure, I might be overanalyzing a bit here, and not everyone might make that connection, but it's hardly what one would expect a state trooper to be rolling around in on the clock. One thing's for sure, it has plenty of trunk space. Makes it ideal for shocking reveals. See? Boy, safe and sound. Well, I guess that explains what he was doing at the reenactment. Hammers forces his new captives to lug Cam down to the basement before barring the door behind them, and just sort of letting them free roam the environment and its untold resources completely unsupervised. Jesus, dude, how in the hell? Did you manage to become both a police captain and cartel boss pulling bonehead moves like this? First, you have Harvey whacked in a largely public environment with an unknown number of potential witnesses. Then, you swing by the next morning thinking you'll be able to just walk away with the money after it's already been cataloged by a separate law enforcement agency as evidence in a homicide. And now you've just turned your back on your only leverage in this situation, who would have to be completely brain dead not to realize that you're planning to kill them no matter what. No sh are going to immediately start breaking windows to try and escape. Seriously, were it not for your guard dog, in about 20 minutes you'd be scratching your head at the empty basement all like, what happened? Of course, now he's gotta come downstairs all smug, acting like he's not a total moron for leaving them all unrestrained. However, little does the captain realize it's all a part of Reggie's clever plan, which apparently also involved letting his niece get her wrist chewed up by a Belgian Malinois. Using a little tactical shit talking, Reggie Lewis their captor into the bleach trap they rigged up, buying him and Kelly enough time to head upstairs and lay a big hurt on Hammer's other half. However, it turns out the old lady's a lot tougher than she looks, and the resulting struggle ends with Reggie taking a pair of scissors straight to the gizzard, because apparently no one but the small boy thought to actually pick up the captain's single action army. Never mind the fact that your little sneak attack hinged on him standing in one specific spot without looking up. A far more reliable and permanent approach would have been to put someone behind the open staircase with a sharp object to slash his Achilles tendons on the way down. From there, you just bash his head in with whatever you can find, and then use the revolver to put down his wife. Okay, sure, it all works out in the end, except guess what? You're literally just putting them both in the exact same situation you just escaped from. Plus, the already open window down there you left behind that they could easily climb through without having to deal with the dog. Better hope a mom sorts herself out in time to come in clutch with a getaway vehicle, because it's only a matter of time before these two halfwits unfuck themselves and come back with a vengeance. Back out in the boonies, Brenda comes to in the midst of a full-blown trash bash, complete with all the homebrew pyrotechnics and lurid temptations anyone could ask for. But before she can fully remove her restraints, one of the Renaissance men swoops in from nowhere to drag her out in front of the chief. Although, it turns out things aren't all what they seem. See, this isn't really a supremacist compound. It's actually a circus. And apparently, these losers are clowns. Or so one might think, watching Queen Latifah single-handedly destroy each and every one of them in hand-to-hand -hand combat, while fighting her way to a side-by-side. -side. And you just know one of these idiots is gonna give her an excuse. Yeah, she won't use that gun. Dude, did you not just watch her annihilate half your friends with her bare hands? It's pretty obvious she could squeeze a trigger. However, despite the show of force, old Chrome Dome still refuses to hand over the bag, citing the simple fact that she can't possibly kill them all with her one remaining shell. And while that might certainly be the case, she knows someone who can, Mr. Cross. Yeah, too bad she didn't think to drop his name before catching the TBI, but this whole mess could have been totally avoided. Also, probably not a great idea to pop off your last shell while walking away. Everyone here already knew you meant business after you dosed that crud ball in the leg. Now we're left to enter the final confrontation completely unarmed. Having already received the coordinates for the exchange, Brenda arrives at the captain's property line just in time to meet up with the rest of the family following their escape. But of course, we can't possibly run off yet. Nah, instead, we need to have a near minute long discussion about whether or not to leave the money behind. And this time, I definitely gotta go with Reggie. Three of our family members 
have seen the hammers' faces. We're well past buying out of the gulag at this point. Might as well hold on to the bag so we can at least afford the therapy once this nightmare is finally over. You know what? Fine. Whatever. Leave the bag behind. I'm sure it'll slow them down for all of two seconds while they ruthlessly hunt us down like dogs. And wouldn't you know it, almost as soon as they get back on the road, a pair of headlights suddenly appears behind them. Fortunately, Reggie had just enough cognizance to remember to hold on to the captain's revolver this time, and now it's up to Brenda to bat them all home. Alright, well, th this could be worse. I mean, it's no XP 100, but it'll still get the point across as long as we do our part. Okay, side picture, breath control, trigger squee- and she dropped it. Fuck. Brilliant. Oh, but that's not all. In the brief exchange of gunfire leading up to the debacle, one of the hammer's shots popped open the back hatch, sending Brenda tumbling onto the road as Reggie takes evasive action. However, instead of simply running her down with a Lincoln and then hosing her family down with buckshot RoboCop style, the gruesome twosome slams on their brakes to methodically line up their final shot. <laughs> What the? What? Was that meant to hurt someone, or are you guys just wasting shotgun shells now? Whichever it is, Brenda's had enough, calling on the hammers to take her life in exchange for her family, who, by the way, are just sitting in the parked suburban doing fuck all instead of, I don't know, hunkering down and sending the 6,000 pound battering ram screaming back into the people that are trying to kill them. Not one to let a good execution go to waste, a crooked cop prepares his nine for the kill shot as Val stomps on the accelerator to make the bullets go faster. But ultimately, it doesn't matter, as just before Mr. Cross or Captain Hammers or whoever the hell he is can squeeze off a shot, Brenda slings a lit road flare in through their busted windshield, distracting the villain just enough for him to remove his wife's head with a negligent discharge. Now, totally out of control, the Continental narrowly zips past the Freemans and plows into a tree, ejecting Hammers face first into the trunk before erupting into a fireball, along with every last dollar that started it all or so it seems. Sometime later, as the Freemen sit down to enjoy some casual post-trauma pancakes, Uncle Reggie steps up to cover the check, piling stack after stack of the dead man's cash on the counter for the entire restaurant to see. And having finally learned the value of grave robbing, the family happily enjoys their breakfast paid for in blood. In the end, everyone made it out alive. Well, except for the hammers and the thugs. That said, had they given common sense a chance and simply called the cops from the motel room without going to investigate, none of this would have ever happened in the first place. Of course, once the heat was on, all they had to do was stash the bag somewhere safe and keep on driving until they reached Houston. And for that reason, I think End of the Road was beat. Moral of the story, crime doesn't pay. Well, maybe a little bit, sometimes. Nerd Explains does not condone committing crimes.